Yes, and welcome to Middle Earth Talk Radio. I'm your host, Hawk, and through the wonders of the Internet and using Google's Plus Hangout, we have Michael Martinez in California and Hawk up here in Washington. Say hello there, Michael. Hello there, Michael. Arr, you be a pirate, you do. Are you enjoying those Google effects? Who says it's Google effects? <laughs> it's a new look for you, Michael. It is. It matches my red shirt. <laughs> Feeling expendable today, are you? Uh, yes. I'm dead, Jim. Darn it, Jim. I'm a computer technician, not a mechanic. Wait a minute. No. <laughs> that doesn't work for me because I've been both, but yeah. So, this is our uh, first attempt at using Google Hangout for just a one-on-one -on -one Middle Earth Talk radio. Uh, we did use it previously at Tolkien Moot 8 with a uh, live audience and also some uh, both live audience at Tolkien Moot and live audience over the Internet. And hopefully future shows will be able to have listeners join in, either just listening or they'll be able to join the Hangout and post questions real time during the show. So let us know how you like this. We'll have just the audio available to download from the website, but also we'll experiment with the video and if uh, people would like to see more videos this way, we'll see about offering that. So, Michael, do you have uh, anything? You have some new news today. So you sent some links there. Would you like to go ahead and discuss some of those? Oh, well, let's, let's rip into Alan Jacobs. Okay, let's. So Alan Jacobs is the Clyde S. Kilby Professor of English at Wheaton College. And he wrote an article for The Atlantic, and he quotes a J.R.R. Tolkien letter. And I'll read the quote. By the last, I intend all use of external plans or devices, apparatus, instead of development of the inherent inner powers or talents, or even the use of these talents with the corrupted motive of dominating, bulldozing the real world, or coercing other wills. I'm going to stop right there. What does it sound like Tolkien is talking about there? Uh, it sounds like that. I was, I was trying to process that because the context, I mean, definitely, you know, uh, the uh, uh, industry and such. And his nope, there is nothing about industry in what I just read. By the last, I intend all use of external plans or devices, apparatus, instead of development of the inherent inner powers or talents, or even the use of these talents, with the corrupted motive of dominating. Bulldozing the real world or coercing other wills. What is he talking about? Dominance with the ring and such. Dominating other wills. Okay. Right. He literally says, you know, okay. Right, dominating. So yeah. he, he gives this process of dominating wills a metaphorical name. He calls it the machine. Mm -hmm. And Tolkien scholar after Tolkien scholar has failed to focus on what Tolkien's talking about and they go on and talk about how Tolkien hates technology, okay? So this whole article in The Atlantic is all about how Tolkien hates technology. And, of course, he brings up other stuff, and, you know, he's, he's the TV and all this stuff. They're equating the machine, Tolkien's machine, which is about how wills are dominated with technology. Instead, and, so, right. and some scholars, you know, they say that technology dominates us, our our wills. But Tolkien's feelings on technology are separate from what he calls the machine. And I I am just flabbergasted every time I see some Tolkien scholar bring up one of these the machine quotes right. and then start to talk about Tolkien and technology as if there's some connection. Because there's a complete Tolkien disconnect. Tolkien would talk about industry as itself and not necessarily call it the machine itself when he talked about those uh, uh, infernal but automobiles and such. I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much he really hated technology or anything like that. You know, there are people still alive who knew him, and, you know, they don't actually go on and on about Tolkien hating technology. Christopher Tolkien being among them, you know, Tom Shippey, I, I don't recall them saying a whole lot about Tolkien being against technology. It's mostly other people who didn't know Tolkien who go on about Tolkien versus technology. That aside, you know, he, he certainly has some strong feelings about, I guess what you call the regression of the countryside before mm -hmm. the advance right. of, of 
industrial civilization. But technology uh, is not the same as the machine. The machine is not technology. The machine is all about the domination of other wills. And it just blows me away how so many people, you know, overlook what Tolkien says about that. Christopher Tolkien tried to explain it, and I've posted, you know, videos. It's or I've linked to videos that someone else has posted uh, where mm -hmm. Christopher Tolkien talks about it. Uh, so apparently, it's a very subtle point, and being that it's a subtle point, I'll grant that I'm probably missing something here. But well, I think there, I think both points are valid. Uh, when I did my essay on Tolkien and trees. Um, he was very specific about industry and, as he called it, the infernal automobile, the infernal combustion engine, as he, as he put it. Um, and he certainly commented about you know, what was happening to trees and um, things such as that. But, uh, but I, I do agree with you in looking at in that quote. That's definitely not referring to the same thing. I could see why that would be frustrating to have that, them lumped together. They, they do indeed seem to be two different topics. Well, if there's a connection between Tolkien's use of the machine to refer to the domination of wills and the adaption of technology by the modern world, these essayists are not showing the correct the connections. Right. They're not showing the connection. They're not, right. they're not making their case. Right. So that's just something that I... It's one of my pet peeves. So... Yeah, we've already talked about the fact that uh, Christopher Tolkien is not thrilled with the movies. There's no news there. <laughs> yeah. We've talked about the fact that uh, Peter Jackson is now trying very hard, apparently, to make a third Hobbit film to drag this out as much as I mean to, to <laughs> give his fans. <laughs> I actually would welcome a third Hobbit film. I would. Sure. For um, more than one reason, I would welcome. A third Hobbit film. It would give me an additional year in which to build up interest in the MiddleEarth.Znet.org website, for example, <laughs> which is not doing badly now. <laughs> so, uh, speaking of the MiddleEarth.Znet.org website, I sent you a couple of links. Uh, some recent questions that came up that um, I decided to take shots at. Okay. And there's a, a commentator uh, who drops by. Uh, his name is Patrick. He lives in the UK. He's actually, I believe he's a, a teaching professor, or he's, he's I believe he's an academic. Um, at the very least, he's very well educated, extremely smart, and knows a lot more about many of these topics than I do, uh, as one can easily discern from, from reading his, his commentaries on my my attempts to answer some of these questions. So I decided to pick a couple of uh, challenging questions for which I don't really have a definitive answer. Uh, the first one is, uh, are there midwives in Middle Earth? And this is, a, this is a question that I remembered someone had asked a long, long time ago in some online discussion somewhere. I didn't remember there really being an adequate answer to that question. There's probably more asked in passing in a longer discussion about something else. Um, so I thought, what the heck, I'll steal some time out of my busy schedule and I'll go do some research. And so Tolkien doesn't ever use the word midwife or any variation of it. But midwife uh, does did, did not always mean what we use it to mean now. In other words, we apply midwifery to a profession uh, that's related to nursing, uh, basically you know, modern nursing for, for mothers giving birth. And so uh, in olden days, about 700 years ago, give or take, midwifery actually was more about uh, the health of women in general uh, mm. associated with birth, giving birth and things like that. But the term has also been used in modern research of women in primitive cultures around the world who are considered wise women, healers, uh, often associated with uh, the birth process. Uh, so it's, it's a word that has been adapted to multiple uses. And 
I didn't know how much Tolkien might have taken that into consideration, but he did use the word wives, plural, wives, mm -hmm. in two different ways. And so one of those ways, uh, the context could be read to mean, you, in other words, the reader could infer that he is sort of talking about midwives, even though he doesn't call them midwives. And, and if you look at the etymology of midwife, it can be used interchangeably with wife and midwife. Uh, you, you can use them interchangeably uh, in certain contexts, obsolete, archaic uh, contexts. We wouldn't do that today. Uh, so I found some passages uh, where uh, he, he refers to wives and, or old wives, and um, you know, most people don't really think of uh, how old wives might be distinguished from, just say, women who happen to be married or widowed and are old. Uh, so I can't say I've made a strong case. In fact, I can say I made a weak case. But I, I think that the old wives are actually Tolkien's version of midwives. So would I want to defend this before a committee of Tolkien scholars? No, I don't have enough citations to do that. But I, I thought it was a pretty interesting uh, connection that could be drawn, uh, even if not well defended. Uh, it, it's an example of how Tolkien used the language very cleverly, it, the way a philologist might, by, uh, by adapting words to very special cases and then building a context around them. Okay, so Hawk is sending me private messages and he's saying, <laughs> sundry folks, uh, don't get why I'm wearing the pirate effects. Geek and sundry folks, I'm wearing the pirate effects because when we did this over Google Plus the last time, I saw my face for an hour. <laughs> Okay, and I don't know about the rest of you, but looking in my eyes for an hour just sort of bothers me. <laughs> Jeez, what a bunch of tech weenies we have here. Okay. <laughs> there you go. That's Michael Martinez and all his raging glory. <laughs> so, now we know. Hawk Robinson speaks for the masses. Michael Martinez speaks for himself. <laughs> oh, wait a minute. <laughs> I'm just acti acting as yeah, a I'm trying not here. to do a product placement here because oh, I was yeah. criticized last time. Oh, because we had the, yeah, right. <laughs> Looks like I'm taking a sip of a secret brew or something. All right, so that was that was my one boring thing there. Oh, he wasn't, talk. clarification from Pyro Pixie. He says he wasn't complaining, he was just confused, that's all. Oh, well, we'll take a vote later on to see which look people prefer. Yeah. I wore okay. my red shirt so that yes. people could, could, you know, like, kill me. <laughs> I, I'm, the, I'm the expendable member of the team this time. So um, I think a more interesting question, um, the one that I asked Friday, was how is Sauron able to trap the Nazgul Miller? I yeah. scarf, scarf that from a forum. Uh, I don't remember which forum. It's probably get asked at a dozen forums every year. Uh, but um, I was—I don't remember what I was surfing for, but as I was looking at the forum question, I also found a quote from Jason Fisher, uh, who wrote this long essay a few months ago, and um, he came up with a conclusion that, uh, let's say, the Ringwraiths are, are more than 4,000 years old by the time of the War of the Ring. How could Sauron accomplish this? And why would it be permitted by the theology Tolkien has established for his fictive world? And I'm not doing Jason any justice here. I'm just doing a soundbite. Unless, of course, Tolkien is not playing by his own rules, a distinct possibility. So I don't, I don't have a definitive rebuttal for this, and I, I tried to make that clear in, in this response. I, just, I saw it as an opportunity to ask my own question, which is, uh, could Tolkien have been inspired by Daniel chapter 10, verses 12 and 13, uh, where Daniel's been fasting. Uh, this is from the Bible, the Old Testament. Daniel's been fasting for three weeks, and apparently he's kind of frustrated because you know he's wondering why he hasn't been getting an answer to his prayers. He's a, he's a prophet, after all. And so this angel finally comes says, Daniel, do not be afraid. I'm quoting from the New International Version. Daniel, do not be afraid. 
from that first day when the better to understand you resolved to mortify yourself before God, your words have been heard, and your words are the reason why I've come. The, pre the prince of the kingdom of Persia has been resisting me for 21 days, but Michael, one of the chief princes, came to my assistance. I have left him confronting the kings of Persia. So that passage has received some interpretation among Protestant writers. I have no idea of what Catholic writers make of it, and I don't know, uh, you know, how the Catholic Tur Church interprets the passage formally, or or whether Tolkien was really very much aware of it, or anything like that. But basically, on the one hand, you know, apparently God has sent out an angel to talk to Daniel, and on the other hand, somebody had the power to hold that angel in check for three weeks before. Michael, the archangel, came and basically took that angel's place in that, in that uh, conflict, struggle, or, or whatever it was. So I just wonder, is, that, is it possible that Tolkien had something like that in mind as far as Sauron and the Nazgul go? Um, because, you know, Sauron is obviously perverting or delaying the natural order of things. These, these men should have died thousands of years before they do finally seek whatever it is that they seek in the end. Uh, but uh, in the meantime, are they dead or are they alive? And I got the impression from Jason's essay that he feels like they are alive. And I think he quotes the, uh, either he does or, or this might be another one of Patrick's great quotes. Uh, anyway, somebody refers to uh, the Princess Bride where uh, they take the man in black to Miracle Max. Mm. And, you know, Miracle Max goes, oh, your friend's only mostly, mostly dead. Mostly dead, yeah. yes. <laughs> so the, the Nazgul are only mostly dead, uh, apparently. I, I think it's in Jason's essay. And so that makes sense. It does sort of make sense. And yet, even if they are only mostly dead and not totally dead, completely dead, um, how is it that Sauron's able to get away with this? Does so Tolkien break his own rules, or is he uh, inspired by something that he simply didn't explain, either in the text or in his private notes, but which is still consistent with his assertion that the Lord of the Rings is an essentially Catholic work? Uh, and so I'm not very well educated in Catholic theology. There's no way that I would, I would try to argue Catholic theology theology. I, I've had a few people explain some, some various points to me about how Catholics uh, see things. And, and I don't think that the Catholics, uh, the Roman Catholic Church really sees the Bible very differently uh, that much from the way a lot of Protestant churches teach it. Uh, there are certainly minor details that uh, are differentiated. That's, that's why there are multiple branches. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh, but you know, I mean, basically a lot of it is, is still very much uh, taught the same way. You know, you, you have uh, the relationship between God and the Jews, and you have God giving the Jews these laws to teach them about sin, and they have a method of, of redemption that they are to execute with the promise of eventual permanent redemption in the form of the Messiah. Uh, and then, of course, the Christian church uh, basically grows up from the tradition that uh, Jesus is the Messiah, the promised Messiah. Uh, and, and so the Roman Catholics and the Eastern, or Eastern Orthodox Church and Coptic Christians, I mean, they, they had all these various ancient sects had different takes on certain aspects of it, but they all agreed on certain fundamental points. Right. And then the Protestants broke off from the Roman Catholic Church in the, in the late Middle Ages or Renaissance period. I don't remember exactly when that was. And so... There are, you know, it, it, it just gradually grows by accretion and diffraction, I guess, uh, uh, but all from the same roots. In any of it, I don't know, uh, I don't feel comfortable, you know, trying to talk about that from a, a Catholic point of view. I just don't know what I would miss. And then there's also the English point of view, the, not the Roman Catholic, but the, uh, the Anglican, I guess, as we call it in America, Episcopalian. Um, Tolkien was raised a Roman Catholic, but uh, he was also a good friend with uh, C.S. Lewis, who converted to Christianity. We can certainly say that uh, J.R.R. Tolkien was more well-versed in Roman Catholicism than I am. 
All right, sorry about that, folks. We do have a few people who are listening on the YouTube stream, so. Well, I bet they think the oh, 60s geez. are good to us now. <laughs> <laughs> Well, since I was born in 1970, that would be, you know, well, indirectly so. <laughs> this show is going to the dogs, folks. <laughs> oh, gee. <laughs> you like those Google effects, don't you? <laughs> I, I'll tell you, man, it's the audio effects that are sending me upstream here. I hear us, okay? I have turned off. I the, the funny thing is I had closed the tab with the video. Okay. <laughs> Meow. Nice little kitty cat face there. <laughs> <laughs> sorry for the interruption affecting Just your flow sorry to there. Just entertain the folks at home because you know what? <laughs> Don't try this at home, kids. We're professionals. <laughs> <laughs> As he puts on the clown face. <laughs> this is the one that Hawk was wearing earlier. The cat uh, mat. I think I'd rather like this one. You know, I am the king, king of clowns king today. Of Yurtle the turtle, king of all you can see. I don't know. Somebody's asking if you're a mog now, M O G. <laughs> your own, you're your own best Space friend. Spaceballs. <laughs> yes, that was Moro okay. Dim. Moro Dim in uh, the Wandering.net asking that. Well, there you go. Okay, folks. He's wearing his Google Foo Google Foo headband. I guess I am. All right. So enough of that. I don't know how much you heard of all that, Hawk, but <laughs> basically I was, I was just going on about how I don't really feel qualified to, to talk about Catholic theology on behalf of J.R.R. Tolkien. But I, I wonder if the Book of Daniel inspired uh, the whole concept with uh, the Nazgul hanging around for so long. be interesting to get feedback from people. Now, your article is on the middle-earth.zenite.org middle -earth site, right? That's correct. Zenite is X-E-N-I-T-E. So people should check that out. And are comments enabled for you to comment? Yes. Or do we need to have them comment? Okay. And, and of course, when this video is uploaded, they can also post comments here. And I'll watch for them, and for our next show, we can always respond to comments. There we go. So, so what do you want to see in the third Hobbit movie? What do I want to see? Well, I'm assuming he's just going to stretch out the content. Remember, we were talking about before last year, uh, Tolkien with Seven, about... Well, where will the cutoff be for the first movie continuation for the second movie? And that, you know, was, that was unclear. So now that changes the, the milestone of, okay, where is the cutoff now going to be if there's three movies? Uh, we, I had argued there was more than enough content with the Hobbit itself to do three movies, no problem, let alone his adding the content from the Lord of the Rings appendices uh, with, Sal, uh, with uh, Gandalf pushing up Sauron from Bill Boulder and things like that. Uh, so, you know, it just uh, isn't a problem. To, you know, I think there's plenty of content for that. I hope he's not going to use it as an opportunity to really embellish a whole bunch uh, instead. When, when instead, he'll be able to include more of what's actually in the books. Um, you know, before we talk about... I'd like to well, see him embellish. Would you? I haven't been real happy. The stuff they, they made up from scratch. They no, no parts out I did. so much of the history for the for the Lord of the Rings. Yeah. You know, Arnor completely vanished. Yeah. Dozens of generations of Arnorian kings and chieftains of the Dunine just gone. Yeah. And all that history was gone. So. Right. Uh, and then all the kings of Gondor, gone. This is an opportunity for Peter to fix that. <laughs> Peter, fix it. Okay? Fix it. You can use all their names. They're in the Lord of the Rings. Do it. That's an order. So, thank you very much. <laughs> Frankly, folks, I'm not real happy with the video format. I, really? Well, Is it too distracting for you? <clears throat> We have all the audio distortion problems that we have when we record the podcast, and I get to see myself waving my hands, you know, which is another reason why I was... You can always just turn your video off. Just uh, up, and you can just click on video, and boom, just make it audio only. Are you kidding me? Wow. Yeah, see? see how easy that, that is? That sucks. But then, it's still, but then it's still an interactive show as far as people being able to post and listen to the show live 
And if they want to join the Hangout, if they have a Google Plus account, they can join in in here and post questions either in the chat room, etc. I mean, of course, we've always had the IRC chat where they can do it and through the website, but hopefully this would encourage a little more interactive. And then also when we have guests. When we have guests and they're doing the talking, maybe it won't bother you so much instead of just, you know, you want to talk Maybe. Talking. But, you know, I still can't watch that last video we did. So you got people in the chat right now, right? Correct. It, not in this chat, but in the IRC chat. Um, I understand in, which chat. But yeah. So are these people asking anything? Uh, they well, they're you're sending me else. They're yeah, they're making comments. I mean, I, I told you the comments they were making. Well, and let, let's let's respond to some of the comments. Let's be slightly interactive. Well, we did. I mean, that was just about your pirate gear and such that you had on. That's all you people um, want to complain about is no. my pirate gear. Pyro, he wasn't complaining. Pyro Pixie in Geek and Sundry IRC says, "I like video. It keeps my goldfish attention span going." <laughs> Okay. <laughs> so some people like to just have that video. You know, a lot of people like to just see the person who's doing the talking, and uh, you know, and other I people could, don't. I could take a picture of you with my droid, but I won't do that. So <laughs> here we are. <laughs> yeah. So it'd be it, good to it, get it, some it, feedback. Um, it would. This is probably really where we should end it because there aren't, there isn't that much to talk about, and Hawk and I have not yet gotten back into the rhythm of things. There has been a long right, time. It's been a long time, yeah. Although, you know, I, as I said, I could talk briefly about the Tolkien RPG stuff I'm working on mm -hmm. just a little bit. Snore. All right. Sorry, really? did you say something? Oh, Actually, ouch. you know what? There there are a lot of people interested in Tolkien RPG right now, apparently, you know, with the One Ring uh, game. Uh, why don't you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. The One Ring game? Because you okay. played that. You played that. how we uh, used it. Yeah. Tolkien Mood 8, yeah, just the other week. Uh, uh, Morrowdim's commenting in the wondering.net that Tornado and Morrowdim are carrying my throne that I'm sitting in right now. <laughs> I, I very much enjoy it. Um, this is what a lot of ornate carving. So you, you should point there, out so there, to, to the listener, to the viewers at home, that anybody else mm -hmm. sitting in that chair would look like a dwarf. Yeah, that's that's true. Chair. This is just the right size for me. That's true. <laughs> tell, tell them how tall you are. Over 6'7". <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Modest. Well, that, that Mr. Modest. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, The One Ring, a uh, role-playing game by uh, Cubicle 7 and Sophisticated Games. Um, mostly written by Francesco McDormand. And uh, we used it for the first time at Tolkien Moon. As far as I know, other than Gen Con last year when they introduced it and then Gen Con coming up, it hasn't been played in any other convention. And certainly there aren't any other Tolkien role-playing game conventions. And it was it went well. The, the group liked the balance of you know, enough of a system to, to have enough dice rolling and such, but still pretty flexible for you know, R-O-L-E playing as opposed to R-O-L-L playing. Uh, I played with a diverse group in, in ages, uh, you know, from teenager age up to 40s. And uh, everybody had a good time with it. We did a setting around the... Uh, we did a setting... Uh, I, set the adventure up to be before the Shire, when the hobbits were still in the upper side vales of Anduin, and starting to migrate west, and eventually would be the Shire, although not, not yet. They were crossing the uh, Baron Duin, I think, was the river they had to cross later on in the Shire. That, that wasn't happening yet. This was an intermediate stage of their migration west. And was this an adventure that you uh, devised, or did it come out of the, the game yes. itself? No, it's an adventure I wrote. I, it's an, the, the game system is set up in the time period between the end of The Hobbit and the beginning of Lord of the Rings. The first the core rules are set up, I think, about 30 years after the end of The Hobbit. And the Hobbit. And then the original plan for the game was they were going to offer two other core set releases, and they would detail other sections of Middle-earth. So this... The, the original core set details around basically all of Mirkwood's Wilderland is the area that's detailed. 
Uh, so from just west of the Misty Mountains, Rivendell and such, although the Shire is kind of squeezed in at the edge of the map, to just east of Lake Town and then the southern uh, south of Merkley, and then north uh, past the mountains. And that's, that's detailed in the original course set. Um, in fact, here. Uh, so it was, I set it in the same area, but I set the time period to be around third age. Uh, we're just looking at 1500, but I moved it to about 1050. Uh, some people commented that by 1500, there were only the fellow hides left up north and none of the others. So kind of moved it back. And basically, they were feeling the pressure of the developing shadow in southern Mirkwood. It was still green with the great, but it was starting to become known as Mirkwood. And so the hobbits, under the pressure from that and increasing trouble with orcs and other uh, situations, started migrating west to get away from the trouble. And That was the so question on the mailing list that, that got me into trouble. What's the, oh, yeah, the, about the time period? Were there any <laughs> stores over there? You know, and instead yeah. of looking up in the books, I just whip off an answer off the top of my head. Oh, yeah, I think there were yeah. there stores there. Yeah, we got like 20 and, uh, different responses. I still haven't gotten through all of them. But it was really, I was really glad to get somebody, that. Somebody yeah. quotes the book or something like that, and all I could write back was, there's no defense for this. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the Martinez has been shut down. But <laughs> <laughs> it was really appreciated, though, the response I got from everybody. And so the, the adventure is up on the Tolkien Moot website under the Tolkien Moot 8 uh, files. Uh, it is not as detailed as some of the other adventures I've released up there. It's also up on the ARPG.com website. In fact, that might be where it is right now. I'm not sure if I put it on Tolkien Moot yet. Uh, all the adventures that I've written for Tolkien Moot for the past eight years uh, are up on the ARPG.com website. And most of them are on the Tolkien Moot site as well. And uh, some are more detailed than others. Uh, the way I write the adventures, of course, is generally meant to be system agnostic. You can use any role-playing game system you want. Um, the stats are usually in the back as appendices, and the main adventure is generally system-free. Uh, this time it was definitely more influenced by the One Ring, and I used their map. And they, For example, they followed a little river inside of Western Mirkwood, that is nowhere to be seen. There's a little river and map, or a lake on the map. It's nowhere to be seen in any of Tolkien's maps that I can find, or any of the Merc maps, or I can't remember. I didn't. I don't in think I Western Merkwood? Yeah, in Western, Western Merkwood. That sounds interesting. And yeah, so he added a little. It, it, uh, Francesco said somebody had suggested that to him, so he'd integrated that in. So the the Hobbit, the, the people trying to free the Hobbits that have been captured by orcs since part of the adventure, were following that stream, and uh, I, I used that Tor map, the One Ring map. So, so, so there. he's inventing his own parts of Middle Earth. Well, I maybe <laughs> that was what it seemed to me. I haven't researched it further. I'd love to know what others thought of that. Aspect. It's in the adventure, in the, the module that's on the website. I have the map and I zoomed it in, and you can see the actual little river and lake that, that Francesco included there in the map. Um, and I just went ahead and used their map instead of the previous Merc and, and Tolkien maps, for, for better or worse. Um, well, but yeah, people enjoyed the system. It's a very simple. What's that? You don't want to say for worse. Well, I mean, uh, just as far as uh, the whole canon, the, here we go with the canon word with Tolkien, as far as the canon things go, some people might have a connection bit about that. Oh! But people enjoy the system. It's a lot of fun. What? Well, I'm just looking at the map close up, and, you know, there's places where you could almost map? imagine, uh, not not the One Ring map, but the Tolkien map. You could, you could interpret okay. some yeah. places as, you know. Sure. Sure. Here, hang on a second. I'm People see me leaning into the seat. camera here. You know, so I'm leaning <laughs> to the... <laughs> hang on just a second. Okay, folks, we're going to interrupt this live broadcast so that uh, Hawk can Will go you? talk to people. And you can hear him yelling in the background. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, folks, I don't know how long this live video broadcast thing is going to work, so enjoy it while you got it. I... Personally, I uh, would prefer to go back to the old MP3 format so that Hawk can record everything and then edit it seven months to two years later. Ouch! <laughs> Pain. Okay, I don't know how else it's going to show up because if you see 
everything's backwards with this camera. Can you see? Looks like Merkwood to me. Let's see. My finger gets in the right. We see that we, we see the river and the lake. Yeah, that are not none, on the and map. none of that's yeah. None of those are in Tolkien's maps that I've found. I don't know nope, when Karen not, Fox not in added. Tolkien's map, but yeah. You know. So they added that, and so the adventure started just near the well, actually where the dot is on this map, which isn't included. In, wait a minute. But yeah. I have found the rabbit in Tolkien's map. The rabbit. Yeah. Which which rabbit are you referring to? The very tiny rabbit. <laughs> you, you never heard that joke about the dollar bill? Let me see if I have a dollar on me. So, this is an old joke we used to play on each other's kids. We'd, we'd hold up a dollar and we'd say, you know, there's a there's a rabbit. Uh, right there. No, right there. Maybe it was a five dollar bill. I'm going to say it was under the pyramid or something. Uh... I remember pillars, so maybe it was a five-dollar bill. Uh, so anyway, that's say, you know, there's the rabbit, right? And you'd spend like five minutes staring at the dollar bill. And finally you'd say, I can't see it, which is what the other kid's waiting for, right? And he goes, that's because mm -hmm. it's behind the third pillar. And that's when you want to take out a hammer and pound your best friend's head in. At least that's what they do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So you know the rabbit's behind the third tree from the left in octagon seven Y, comma G. <laughs> Player's handbook. Okay. There's. Yes, but there you rabbit? have something different about it. It's in leather. So Wizards of the Coast, because I guess they've completely run out of original ideas, has reissued the original first edition of Dungeons and Dragons Player's Handbook. The Dungeon Master's Guide and the Monster Manual. And the funds from purchasing this are going towards the Gygax Memorial, Gary Gygax, co creator of Dungeons and Dragons, to create a statue of Gary Gygax. <laughs> and it is the original rules with all the errata, it's the same font. Apparently, it took them months to find the right font to get it dialed in. And, uh, it's not actually leather. It just looks like it. It's just a fancier cover, but it uses some of the original art in the center. And then it adds a little bit of a, has a little uh, ribbon for a marker, page Hawk. marker. So, what does this have to do with Tolkien, Middle Earth, the Lord of the Rings? I, I know, I know. Well, other than that, Dungeons and Dragons had an awful lot of Tolkien in it originally, and then they had to change the names because of copyright infringement. You know, you know it was just something that came point, across last week. We are down to two guys talking at each other on video. Okay. okay. All right. All right. So, um, yeah, it's just I, as far as uh, Tolkien role-playing gaming, you know, I've done a bunch of updates on my system, the AI role-playing game system. Uh, the basic rules have been available for download. I just recently updated it and uh, updated the download for the basic rules on the AIRPG.com website. And... Um, Additionally, I've been working on the standard rules that are a lot more detailed. The, the basic rules are for just absolute beginners. They've never role-played before and just want to get a taste of what role-playing gaming is about in a Tolkien setting. And it's generally meant for just a, one or one to three adventures. It's not for a long campaign. It is just super stripped down. It only means one six-sided die, and it's just very elementary. And the standard rules are, more, are an actual complete role-playing game system. And so I've been scrambling to try to get the standard rules done and bail on the site. A couple of people have been going, okay, let's see the standard rules. Let's see the standard rules. You keep talking about it. You keep posting outlines of it. Let's see the actual rules. So that's progressing. And then, of course, all the adventures are now finally on the website that haven't been uploaded for years. I mean, I had stuff for MerpCon and Tolkien that I kept meaning to upload and only got, a, got around to this past week to finally help exporting them to PDF and make them available both the Tolkien Moot and the ARPG website. So for those who are in both channels who are role-playing gamers in Tolkien setting, those are available. Do with what you will. They're freely available. And I guess that's it for today. Uh, we would gladly take questions and suggestions for what people would like to see discussed. If you have questions... Maybe something interesting. <laughs> yeah. Thanks a lot. <laughs> uh, well, that includes my stuff, too. I mean, you know, this is like... This was the episode where I promote my stuff and Hawk promotes his stuff because there's really well, nothing back to in the talk groove. about. 
Well, we're getting uh, back in the groove, too. Yeah. We haven't done I, the prep. I don't think we've ever been in the video groove, Hawk. Well, yeah, this is, yeah, the video is a new thing, so we got to get the hang of that. And, and I'll try to be more prepared for the next show myself. Take me back. I, I prefer the audio. Let me just, just click on no video for you at that. Great. So we'll just, we'll just, there you go. People are <laughs> watching a blank screen there. That's, that's really beautiful, man. Really beautiful. Again, I will export this straight to an MP3 and make that available. But there are people who like the video, and let's just give it a shot a couple of times. And if it doesn't catch on, if we will, we, just we, will give it a shot. we will I give will, it a shot. I will post on the MiddleEarthTalk.com website saying, "You guys want a bit more video, or do you want us to just stick with <laughs> this is pirate patch, or do you want us to stick with just pure audio and hide our ugly mugs from everybody?" Right, because so. it's it's going to have to stop being. We we are going we are going to have to stop calling it Middle Earth Talk Radio. We're going to have to it's call it a talk show. Two old fat guys talk show. I don't know. I mean, it's like... Hey! You're right. I'm not fat, but I'm getting there. I'm working on it. <laughs> Middle, we can just say the Middle Earth talk show. You know, well, I don't think we can say the Middle Earth talk show. Well, just Middle Earth talk. I mean, that's really the domain it's at anyway. Well, yeah, we can call so. it Middle Earth talk, man. So. Yeah. Okay. Do our, get our, our Cheech and Chong. Uh, there you go. It looks suave and sophisticated. Well, we're going to wrap up here. So uh, if anybody has any questions, it uh, doesn't look like anybody's posting any questions at this point, so I think we'll call it a night. Um, this, will, of course, will be available on the YouTube channel. I'll probably take it off from being public and make it private so I can download and edit it out and make it flow. See you in eight months, folks. Ouch. <laughs> but let's see if we can resume this. Do you think Sunday 7 p.m. is something we can do regularly? We can try. Okay. We and that way you can, and that's specific time, folks, so that maybe people who want to tune in, we can try to be ready in time to actually go live Sunday 7 p.m. Pacific time and have a live audience join in on conversation. So if people would like that, let us know. Post on the YouTube comments. Post on the MillerTalk.com website. Please do let us know. And you can let me know in the IRC chat rooms. I hang out in both the, in, in the OneRing.net IRC room, in the Merp chat, IRC.Merp chat room, and in the GeekAndSundry.com chat room. So I mean, all of them, feel free to make comments. And I hope everybody enjoyed. Michael, thank you for being a sport and giving this a shot. I know it hasn't been your cup of tea, but we'll see if it works out in the next couple episodes or not. And we can always just go back to it, no problem. Be fast. Hi. All right. Thank you, Michael. You have a good evening. And thank you. Mark. Everybody else who's listening, these uh, shows and the previous 42 episodes are available on MiddleEarthTalk.com. Uh, this show is not endorsed or licensed by any of the Tolkien copyright holders, including but not limited to the Tolkien Estate, or Middle Earth Enterprises, aka Tolkien Enterprises, as Saul's and DBA, or New Line Cinema, or any of the other copyright holders. I Hope you've enjoyed the show, and wherever you may be, be well, Namari.